like walking around the Mike Sunderland, so you might have to shuffle in a bit if you get more people. Mm. Cool. So um, I'm Jeremiah Alexander. I'm currently the web development instructor at General Assembly, and I'm currently teaching my fourth batch of students, some of whom are in the audience today. And in total, I've taught about 80 students. Um, and I just wanted to share with you some of the experiences I've had watching them build products. So to go back in time a bit, um, about just over 10 years ago, I set up my own development shop. And my first project was a game working with a bank to help kids learn how to manage their money better. I had like a really crazy revelation the other day. Um, I remember doing some user research for this project and being in a school doing uh, like focus groups and the students were about 15. Now I realize actually they'll be like 25 years old now. And hopefully they're like managing their finance as well because of what we taught them in the game. Um, but then sort of moving on from that, my last product was a platform for connecting grandparents and their grandchildren through the customization of interactive stories. Now, between that point, between those sort of 10 years, I've done like various projects in gaming, in VR, in um, web, mobile, and like even in interactive teddy bears. So all sorts of experience. But when I moved to Singapore, I think I was, I was ready for a new challenge. So I craved something new and I threw myself out of my comfort zone. And I took up teaching, which is like the worst thing for a software developer who's used to just hiding in the corner. Um, so I joined General Assembly, and in the past year, um, I've taught this, the Web Development Immersive, which is a 12-week boot camp where we take people from non-coders through to getting their first jobs as junior developers at some of the best companies in Singapore. So I've personally taught over 80 students, and on the course they make four projects, so each one a uh, one-week sprint. So in total, I've probably seen like well over 200 projects go through, but I thought like 100 sounded catchier, so it's 100 MVPs as opposed to so 200 MVPs. And so what I wanted to talk about today is like not what I teach them or how do I get them job ready, but what have I learned in the process? So inadvertently, what have they taught me about product development? So the first part is like, where do their ideas come from? And I think this is this is the part I, I really love, right? I like seeing, like, we don't tell them what to make. We give them a week and then say, all right, so you're going to have to build something. And then they have to come up with something to build, and then they have to build it. So trying to see the sources of this inspiration is really exciting. And I've categorized it into, I suppose, three main sources, just because, like, everything's better as a trichotomy, right? Um, so I think the first one is they... They scratch an itch that they or their friends have. So whether that's a case of that they might want to build a sporting platform for like organizing group sports events, or they love they love airplanes and they want to be able to track them all the time whilst they're in the sky, or like occasionally they inadvertently end up scratching my itches by like building platforms to to find the best coffee shops or co-working spaces in Singapore. And so I think that this is something which is, which is really common. And I think another way is like when people come to the course, they often have a prior career or previous experience. And one, one of the avenues I see is that they try and form a synergy with what they previously knew and what they're learning here. So like, for example, that might be a finance professional looking at how they can do predictive modeling on like the returns on investments. Or it might be someone from an architecture background trying to make a crowd and planning platform for you know, housing, how housing is going to work in 2050 when you can reconfigure apartment blocks. And I think that these ideas are also really exciting because they're kind of that, they're at that intersection between, between worlds. And then sometimes they like, I suppose when they don't have an existing itch or they don't have some prior experience that they want to utilize, they end up making a sort of a me too product, like something which works really well in another market, but perhaps just doesn't exist here yet. So maybe that's like a, a, a co-buy-in product, or maybe that's a, a task running platform. And so I think that that's often another source of their ideas.
And so I think, like, whilst it's interesting to see where the ideas come from, it's then the next step is like, what do they actually build? And we don't tell them what to make, but we do give them technical requirements. So we do say this particular project has to be built in Ruby on Rails, it has to use a Postgres database, and a user must be able to sign up, a user must be able to uh, log in, and then you have to use at least three database tables. So we give them some technical requirements, but then they are still very free and very open to decide what features to implement. And I think, you know, often it is a technology push. So often it's a case of there is some really interesting framework or API that they want to use and then they can see features that take advantage of that. Like Google Maps is incredibly popular and I think a lot of students try and have a Google Maps based project there. But also like public APIs like data.gov.sg or Spotify, like all of these open sources, people see these really cool technologies and then want to play around with them and think about features that enable them to do that. Now, unlike, uh, we also have a user experience design course. <coughs> unlike our user experience design course, we don't require students to go and do customer research. So I think the majority of our ideas are not what we'd say like market call ideas. Now, I think what's What's interesting about this is like once in a blue moon, we do get some students who will go and do like customer validation and maybe they even like send out these surveys. Uh, and this is really cool. I say once in a blue moon, this has happened once. <laughs> uh, like all of the students I've taught, this is the only time I've actually seen like these surveys presented in a presentation. So once in a, a very, very, very blue moon. And then there's something else around of quality and this is like a bit of a confession and it's something which it maybe isn't obvious but often the products with the richest features the ones that look the most polished are not necessarily the ones that are the most technically robust or the ones which follow the best development workflows so like on the course we teach a lot of agile development best practice so things like test driven development pair programming continuous integration lots of this really cool stuff and occasionally, slightly more often than the blue moon, but occasionally we see students implement these to a T and they end up with very nice, very robust products, but they're often just not that sexy. And I think that this is something which, you know, kind of makes me reflect on my own parts because this is something I've seen in my own experience and in startups is that often we just assume that, you know, robust, reliable, high quality products are the side effect of great developers and we don't allocate them time in that product roadmap. And I think that this is perhaps a mistake that we often make, is we should be thinking about these as like core features of our product if they're important. So how it actually gets built, this is the fun part for me. It's like, and I spent far too much time trying to, to categorize everyone into these, these molds. Right? And obviously, because everything I like is in threes, I've come up with like three categories of maker. So how do they go about actually building this stuff? So the first kind I like to call the artists. And for them, like the, the work is never finished. They never have an intention of having a complete project after this week long sprint. They just have this grand vision of something that they want to build. And it might be something that they've always wanted to build, or it might be in something that they think is going to be this next big unicorn idea and they just do as much of it as they possibly can within the time frame. Interestingly, I say that I would probably cast myself as this first type in that I have these really grand ideas and I just try and do as much of them as time permits. The second type I like to call the tailors and I think with them they have a sort of impeccable sense of time management and resource. You know, perhaps they're coming from sort of project planning backgrounds or um, you know, other roles that require them to, to be very analytical. And they're really good at working out exactly what's achievable within the time frame. So they have one week and they manage to design and conceive a product that they can implement perfectly in that timeline. So whilst their ideas might not be the most ambitious, they often do end up with very polished looking products, very polished finished products. And the final group I like to call the um, sculptors. And 
I think that the difference, once my slides eventually load, but I think the difference with this final group is they break everything down into really tiny chunks. So they always think about it as like, what's the, what's the smallest thing that I need to do? And then they start with that. So they like pick one part and then they finish that. And only once that's finished, only once that one component is perfected, do they think about what comes next. And so whilst I think they might not end up with the most ambitious project because they're not starting with really ambitious ideas, and whilst they might not end up with the most polished projects, they're always the first students to meet the technical requirements of the assignment. So they're always the first students to tick that box of having passed. And I think often they end up exploring like one or two features to a really great level of depth. So something on, which on the surface, like um, you know, a, a rating system which might seem very simple, actually has like a lot of research and depth that's gone into it. So, what about the results? Um, so we kind of talked about like where these ideas come from, like what features, what they decide to build, and then their personality types that, you know, how do they go about making it? So, I apologize for my slides, far too many animated GIFs and videos in there and lack of internet. Let's go, go. But let's talk about the results, eventually. So, I want to start with the obvious and try and anticipate some of your questions. So, one part would be like, well, is this just, you know, is this just hype? And I think some of you may be thinking, well, like, how much can they actually know in 12 weeks? Like, really? Can they, you know, it, am I just like overselling it? And am I just trying to get more people to sign up to GA? Um, and I think like this is, you really have to just dig in and see these products to really understand that actually a lot of this is like technically and idealistically very exceptional. So like for instance, I even had like one student who designed and built a product that I had had the same idea and like I had literally been wireframing a couple of weeks ago. And you know, the difference was that you know, she built it in one week, whereas though I had like bookmarked time like three weeks in the future for me to actually even start on it. So, you know, she had the first mover advantage. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know it's annoying, right? Um, but also, I, I think that this kind of goes into something else about like this whole notion of this sort of rock star engineer. And I, I'm not claiming to be one, but I think, you know, if, I envy the students a lot because they have maybe sort of 28 plus days over the course to work on projects. And those are usually at least 12 hours a day. So we're talking like 300 plus hours to work on stuff. And like me as, as a, a developer who's still, you know, still developing, maybe I dedicate like an hour every evening, every work evening to do, to do my projects. Like for me to put in that same amount of time, it's going to take me over a year. <laughs> so I have to be like at least four times as good just to even keep up. And I think that that's something which is, uh, which is really interesting um, and worrying for me as a uh, wannabe rock star developer. Right. But I think, you know, part of that would do, it's kind of okay. I think we're not out of our jobs yet. And I think the big problem is that whilst I always try and encourage these students to like polish their work up a bit, sign up real users, you know, send that press release out to Tech in Asia, get that product out there. Like, it seldom happens. And I think, unfortunately, I know of maybe one product out of all of them that's still in active use. And I think that that's quite sad. I think that's the, the saddest part. And I think to some degree it's because people, you know, they get jobs and then so they have the same time problems that we do, so the same constraints. But I think also, unfortunately, I think it's about belief as well. And I think much like some of you might think, well, how much can they actually know in 12 weeks? I think the reality is that often that's something that they feel themselves is, you know, after 12 weeks, how good can I actually be? Am I good enough? And so trying to install confidence within the students and trying to get them to believe in themselves is one of my hardest jobs as an instructor. And I think consequently, it's something that I understand quite well on a personal level. And like probably one of the biggest things I've learned about building products is as often quite introverted makers, you know, we love 
what we make. And any time that we release a product, we are putting it out there to the world and we're, you know, we're seeking like validation on a personal level as well as in terms of a business idea. And so, you know, whilst an MVP might be like the greatest the route to success, you know, give us the quickest way of learning, it kind of goes against that natural instinct that we have to sort of protect ourselves from, from uh, like a, a broken heart. Um, and that's maybe a bit too deep. So <laughs> here's a game that one of the students made. Let's go. Thank you. Questions, Q and A, discussion, ideas, disagreements. Hey, Seb, WDI one in Seb. <laughs> uh, I, I like what you said about the, uh, the the fact that you like focus too much on the tooling and uh, doing the project right, whatever that means. That can't do it. But I, I like to say that like, you can actually make a good career out of that. So, and so that's a that's a really really good goal. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, I definitely. I think it's that that idea that they. I think they are kind of um, like two things which need to be thought about, right? It's like kind of like, like thinking about the tool and thinking about the, the the strategy to building the best product, like you say, and then also it's like, like building the product. And I think often, I suppose like blindly we can just assume that they're the same, right? And like it's just if you have great developers, they like they don't need to think about process. And stuff. I don't know if there's a name for the role or anything. <laughs> there should be, shouldn't there? We should come up with that. We'll come up with a new type of yeah. super process person. Mm. Cool. I mean, if I could just riff on that, I mean, having done a startup, I'm literally, um, I think it's the pressure is very much on features, right? It's going to be a race for features, at least in the early days. And, you know, Writing the code myself is literally like, I'll come back to this later, right? Uh, and because 50% of, uh, you know, zero to 50 is better than zero and then getting to 80 maybe sometime in the future, uh, which you may not be around for. Right? So like that, I think, it, at least in a startup, and I think a lot of times, like the, the code, you, I think what's important is you, you accumulate the tech debt, but you know that you're doing it, and you're doing it as a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to make that trade off, right? And, and to, I think that's something that takes time to kind of figure out, like, is this the right thing or not, right? And sometimes being able to adjust quickly and say, oh shit, this is wrong, let's do it, let's fix it now before it gets even worse, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I totally agree. And I think it is, it's about, it is about that relationship with your customers as well, right? right? So it's like, you know, like you say, you take on some of that technical debt, knowing that you, you might address it in the future, but. It, like, what's the message that you send to your customers? Like, is reliability of your platform, is it about trust, like the first speaker said today? Is that the most important reason why people come to you? And if so, like, do you then need to like prioritize a lot of this, a lot of that stuff over the sort of breadth of features? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I guess, uh, I guess that part was kind of, it has to work yeah. externally, it has to work, right? Uh, the question is, do you? Uh, so this concept of yapi, have you heard mm -hmm. it? Yeah, you yeah, ain't yeah. ever gonna need it, right? Yeah. Like so, you could build um, some really. I, I'm thinking, struggling coming with the right an analogy, but um, like, uh, say, a bicycle would, you know, kind of works for now, right? And you could think that your vision might be well, it's gonna turn into a flying aeroplane, but maybe that's not where the customers end up, or what you need, or want, or whatever. So. So you kind of just consciously say, I know it might turn into a plane one day, but I'll tackle that problem when it becomes a problem. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Right. yeah um, of the students who don't complete a project, like, what's the most common reason you see why that doesn't work? They have no choice to not complete it. <coughs> they must the, stay as many the hours. The, the, the less successful project. No, I think that's I think that's fair. I I would say if I'm honest, I would say that the biggest factor is passion. That's it. I, I find that occasionally it's for some people like getting to coding 
or they're interested in coding and then they get into it and their hearts are just not in it. And I think that that's by far the, you know, the largest region, reason. So even if someone like, doesn't maybe have the, the very strong mathematical or logical foundations, but they really love an idea, they find a way. So they find a way to get to that. And then likewise, for those who are technically very strong, they get to a point. But it's the one who kind of gets to you know, 4.59 and they're like, I've had enough coding for today and I'm going home, I give up. I, so I, it sounds weird, but I think it is all just about like how much they enjoy what they're doing and how much they're willing to invest during that time. If you were to stop teaching and then move on to another job, what do you think, if, if that happens, what do you think would be the biggest takeaway you, you, you will have from having done this? The biggest takeaway? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think if I go back to my sort of categorization of, um, of types of people and, and sources of ideas, I don't want to say I, I won't believe in my ideas as much, but I think I'll be less dismissive of other people's ideas. Um, which sounds silly, and it sounds so obvious, and it, and it is obvious, but I, I think often you know, we just believe that we know that our idea is better than everyone else's idea, and like our approach is better than everyone else's approach. And I, I think maybe I'm a bit less opinionated, a bit more like, open-minded, now would be one one takeaway. Is that the best one? Um, maybe, maybe something. Maybe just being a bit more, a bit more open-minded. Right. Mm. Right, I understand. Uh, GA does job uh, placement for your students at the end of the whole thing. So how do you real jobs? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, so how do you actually convince the startups, uh, the, the companies, many of them you know, they put a lot of money and effort into actually building up something for their business, to actually place their trust with someone who has only done it for 12 weeks? Mm. I think that's, you, yeah. that's a great question. Um, I wonder whether like, there's a bunch of graduates with jobs in the audience. I wonder whether any of them would want to answer that question for me. Oh, um, also, I'm happy to. Anyone going once, going twice? I, <laughs> I think ultimately, I, I remember once a, a friend of mine once telling me that we thought that after two years as a developer, there, there was no difference in like, experience. And I think his, his argument was that someone who's really sort of proactive in their learning and their growth, after two years working in a particular field, would have built, made a lot of depth there. And ultimately it's very easy for someone to sit in a role and just like coast for 10 years. So 10 years experience is not necessarily better than two years experience. And I think interestingly as well, like now, even if you look at tech, tech moves so quickly. So the stuff which I learned when I was studying is not <coughs> the stuff that I'm applying now. And so the, probably the most important skill for a developer is their ability to learn and to pick up new frameworks, to have a good foundation, but to be able to pick up new stuff. And so that's a lot more about attitude, approach, and attitude than it is about the particular tech stack that they know. And so I think whilst you might get someone who's spent two years working with a particular tech stack, if they've got the wrong attitude, they've got the wrong attitude, they're not going to be able to progress from it. So I think what the startups do and the so big dev shops who recruit from GA value is it's the raw materials. It's like coming and finding people who are really passionate, really hungry, and they know that if they invest a year, two years in this person, this person will be on the road to being a rock star engineer. <coughs> mm. um, so you talk about uh, the some engineers being the artist, uh, quote unquote. Um, being a product manager, um, I've been um, I've managed a lot of projects which are done by the so-called artists because um, yeah, things just, just doesn't seem to get done. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of like um, because um, the uh, the confusing part of or the um, I think the, the moral 
um, the moral di dilemma that um, anti-separate mentioned we face is that sometimes we do get that feeling that they want to have this grand vision, they want to have this great product, um, but, but um, yeah, of course, the pra pragmatic um, mindset is that we just need to get something shipped. We need something else to deliver. Well, my question is that um, if you, uh, as a teacher, um, do you, um, uh, sorry, is it wise to somehow discourage those um, uh, those traits of wanting to build the perfect thing just so they can be um, they can be seen as productive? Because uh, at, the other, at the end of the day, if you then if you don't get something shipped, then that means you are you you, you don't get something shipped. So do you think, as a teacher, is there, is there something um, about those artists that you think uh, their niche of productivity, well, where, where, does it, where does it fall? Mm. So, so the question, okay, so thinking about the different types. Um, I'm a big believer in like complementary. And so I think that ideally you want a culture that has people <coughs> with different mindsets. <coughs> like, and as I mentioned, I consider myself that first type that's sort of idealistic, big vision, let's go to Mars type. Um, and it's a bit like the flying, flying aeroplanes. Maybe we don't need that yet. Maybe we need to start with, with it just the bicycle. But I think that I suppose there's kind of two parts to it. One is saying that even if you have a natural tendency towards a certain type, and I don't think it's just developed. I think it's just all of us, right? So you, know, you get the exact same thing with CEOs. And you'll get some CEOs who have this grand vision, and you'll get some CEOs who are just looking at the P&L, right? And I think it's the same. So, I think in part, like, there's a res reflective component, which is like analyzing ourselves, analyzing our team, and saying, you know, what types do we have? And then there's a acting as if you were the other types. And I think that that's a more, then it becomes more of a discipline. So, like, whilst I'd naturally say I was an artist at heart, you know, I never missed deadlines. Because I, I understand that that's important. And so I'll have this grand vision but I will just park it somewhere. And I'll switch to a different mindset that allows me to plan that better and make sure that I achieve those goals. But I think, you know, that there's detriment to each of the kinds, right? So if you if you never think about that vision, that bigger picture, when you get to a point where you you know you finished your run of features or you don't know where to get go next, as an organization, as a product, if you have no vision, then potentially you're you're lost as well. So I think you can get lost because you you never ship something, but you can also get lost because you have no idea where to move in the market. So yeah, I, I agree, but I, I think it's that maybe you have a natural tendency to one style and you discipline yourself to try the others. Or you try and build a perfect complementary team of like all sorts to keep them in check. Yeah, so to follow up, you know, because I think um, one of my experiences dealing with some artists that think is that um, because they seem to not uh, they seem to not able to stick to the plans that that we gave the product the product we just gave them. Um, there's there's one exercise in which we decide or we let them to decide how much uh, time they need to do this, mm. and so, somehow um, they, they they seem to stick to it better, um, even if the if the uh, estimate themselves are not really conservative. But they don't uh, ask for two months for to to do something that's under engineers and it's three weeks. But it's just that um, I'm wondering if if we doing that to them. It makes them stick to timelines better, but are we, as part of it, if we do that, are we planning? Uh, are we planning out something that's actually good for for companies? And um, yeah, so I, I guess um, so. Like, do do you think uh, in, in some aspects that artists, engineers need, uh, if, if we can categorize them, do we need to somehow train them, train them to stick to timelines uh, with that, like detriment them in some way? Or would they do something by hmm. um, I wonder if anyone else wants to join in on the discussion on that point. It's not just engineers, of course. Like designers, I think, is one of the most, um, uh, one of the most, uh, I think, liable because designers being more artistic, they, they, they are more perfectionist than I think engineers and designers. What's the question. It sounds a bit like engineering time estimates. And yeah, so I guess it's like um, uh, with your mindset about some engineers or some, I think, uh, builders 
I'm not able to stick uh, to time. Uh, nothing ever seems uh, nothing seems to get done right. in time. Right. And my question is, if we if we try to um, like discipline them to be more to stick more to the timelines by by all methods, are we actually uh, uh, are we are we demoralizing them, or are we training something out of them that's actually unbeneficial? The companies. Can I try answering that question? Have you considered that maybe your engineers are bad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think, uh, I think, I think uh, that's a pretty long stretch there, right? There's so many things in between. Are you doing, are you agile? Are you scoping stuff correctly? Uh, you know, uh, what's the, is the two biggest stories? Is it broken down? And if you have, that's why agile is two mm -hmm. weeks straight, right? Like, Jeremy, you kind of, the other way, you time box and say, what can you do by like then? Uh, and yeah, I mean, maybe the engineer is the greatest, not the great, it's not the greatest role for him, but, or her. Uh, but yeah, things like that. They should come up with their own estimates if they're practicing at job. Right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think there are like a number of factors, right? So there's so many reasons that could be contributing to it. I think, like in part, your question is that if you just crack the whip and like just force everyone, to, you know, force your engineers to just be robots, um, are you losing some valuable qualities? I would say probably. And I, I think that if there are, you know, parts, ways in which they're trying to contribute towards the culture of your organization and towards the vision of your product, then I think you want to try and capture some of that, and perhaps it's just you need a separate vessel to capture some of that. I mean, like I think that the conversations between sort of product and tech need to be from day day one, right? Day zero. I think it shouldn't be a case of just stuff getting dumped in tech. But I say that as like a, as an engineer, right? I, I I hate it when I just see stuff like the day before I'm meant to build it. You know, I like to be involved in that process. I'm sorry. How big is your engineering? Um, it might be a movie, I think. That's your whole Um, for my team. Okay. How many project managers do you have? How many designers, strictly designers? You have an asshole and a designer. How many? Three. Just get rid of all your designers. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to solve the problem, I'm just giving this. So, so I think for project managers, you usually have to break down the user stories to be as small as possible. So they don't take more than a day to complete one feature, for example. So I, I think what our company do, uh, I'm from Linkbox Studios. I used to be uh, from the US uh, Currently, I'm doing data management. So I think what we have recently incorporated is that every time or every start of the week, you have like, a scrum session, talk about things together. And then we'll have number cards to them, and the developers to sit together to estimate how many hours it will take for this meeting to be done. And then you sort of take the average, and then that will be the hours in both for the future. And that's what mm. yeah, you have a team of 10, but you have two project managers, three designers, five engineers. No, no, uh, ten, 10 engineers. Oh, okay, 10 engineers. So more than yeah, I think usually with Google it's like a one to ten or one PM to engineer ratio, right? Yeah. So probably have to be product product Probably engineer. Yeah, I said that as a, having been a product manager and sure. around writing code as well, right? Mm. It's, yeah. it's easy to come up with stuff that is hard to build. about the interactive teddy bear. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Do you really want to know about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe you guys don't get it here. Um, in the UK, we've got a, a TV show called Dragon's Den. And um, like, um, that's where like, people go and pitch their ideas to investors. Shark Tank. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, same as oh, Shark Tank. Okay. 
Hmm, maybe I shouldn't talk about this. Am I under NDA? Maybe I'm under NDA. <laughs> Is that camera still on? <laughs> Walking around, they might stumble in, so you might have to shuffle in a bit if you get more people. Mm.